Yeho, good morning. Let us start, or morning or whatever. Let us start today's lecture. And what we'll do today is we'll talk about interpreters. Mainly two ways of building an interpreter. First, executing the syntax trees. Going through the syntax trees that you have built uh, and performing what they tell you to perform. We'll look at how to do that. And also stack machines, which requires generating code for that stack machine. Yeah, but first, I'll say something about other approaches. And the first one is <coughs> line by line. If you want to uh, create an interpreter, read the source code, and as you read each line, you execute it. So, for example, if you have um, uh, a Unix shell, the command language for uh, Linux and other uh, Unix versions, uh, you could have a script that says, uh, uh, echo, hello, uh, ls, uh, while, and you read the first line, echo hello, so it prints hello. Uh, you read the second line, it calls the list command, so it'll list the files. And then, of course, if you have a while loop, which you can have in shell scripts for Linux, uh, then you need to read a few more lines uh, so you can actually perform this loop. But basically, line by line. Uh, <coughs> another way, is the next phase. You have a normal compiler that compiles uh, to a target language, and then the next phase, you just chain on another phase that actually executes the program you have generated. And then uh, it might be a stack machine, or it might be something else. You could also have an independent abstract machine. And then <coughs> it can be discussed if this is still an interpreter or a compiler. If you look at the Java compiler, for example, it compiles to uh, a, co a code that is not executed by, by the CPU, but instead by a program, the Java virtual machine. And combined with that, you can have just-in-time compilation. Uh, C-sharp and uh, the environment that C-sharp runs in is intended to be just-in-time compiled. That is, uh, you compile to code for an abstract machine, and then, instead of interpreting that code, you, when it, the program is running, you first translate it to, to executable code just as it's going to be um, executed. And you could think that that would be very slow, because when you start the program and run it, you not only have to uh, execute the program, you also have to uh, translate, or rather compile, code to executable code. But it turns out it's, it's reasonably fast. OK. Going back now to... Um, executing the syntax trees. Let's say we have our scanner, our parser, our everything else, <coughs> and we build a syntax tree for the code. And let's look at how to handle that. And of course, I forgot to say that the reason that you don't always use this line-by-line -line way of interpreting uh, your source code is, of course, that if you have a more advanced language that lets you define functions and so on, uh, you need to work with the program as a whole. So you need to first re read the entire program, and then you can start executing it. Uh, <coughs> you have seen how to build a syntax tree. You have an expression. Uh, something like two times 
a plus 4. And it is then translated first to a tree. And you know that we need to first perform multiplication and then the addition. So you will get a tree that down here first starts with 2 times a. And then when you have the result, it flows upwards in the tree. So now you can add 4 like this. So how do you calculate this? Well, let's say we have this uh, way of building trees that we saw earlier. You have a plus node, which is a struct that you have allocated with malloc if it's C. Uh, you have a multiplication or times node down here. And then you have leaf nodes. You have a leaf node, uh, a number node, and this is supposed to be not a 9, but the variable a. Uh, you have a variable node, or id as uh, we sometimes call it because it's an identifier. <coughs> uh, and which number? Well, you have a lexical value too, you have a variable, typically a number, but not instead of a name like this, but I, I draw it as a here. And you have um, this number over here, number 4. And you have some sort of pointer that points to this entire tree, like this, to the root. Okay? And this is a struct tree node or struct node or something uh, with, uh, let's say I have a normal integers type field. So plus might be 96 or something. Uh, <coughs> and you have this array here with orgs. This is the same that we saw earlier when we talked about building the syntax trees. Let's say 3, and we can have a separate field here for uh, uh, leaf value, which identifier, which number. As you can see, I have uh, sort of simplified my drawing here, so I don't have both the arguments and the leaf value, I've just drawn one of them. And you can do this uh, if you use a union, which is a variant of structs in C, where you only can store one of the things you list in the union. Anyway, how will our program look? Let's say we build a function, and we want it to return integer, since it's going to calculate a value here. And I might call, call it execute. And what argument do I send to the function? Well, a pointer to this one of these nodes. So if I want to execute the entire tree, I just get the pointer to the root. So I have a struct node pointer. Let's call it p for pointer. And what do we do in this tree? Well, <coughs> if I have, let's say, a plus node, how do I ca calculate this plus this? Well, first, of course, I need to calculate the subtrees. So I need to calculate this subtree and this subtree. So if p pointer to type, oh, sorry. If that is equal to plus, well, I need to do plus. And how do I calculate the subtrees, the values of the subtrees? Well, I'm right in the middle of building a function to do this. So I just call execute with this subtree and that subtree. So I could do something like this. 
return execute p orgs zero. You remember that in C, the first element is in an array is numbered zero. Plus, and let's let's remove this parenthesis. It's ugly. Uh, p point orgs one. So that's what you do for plus. That is, you recursively call this execute function, first with the leftmost subtree. It's this call here. And then with the rightmost subtree. So you will get the results from this tree might be 47, and this one, which is 4. And then you add them together using plus, getting 51, and return that number as the result. So how do we calculate if we get to a times node, a multiplication node? Well, it's almost exactly the same thing, except you multiply instead of add. So, else, if this is a multiplication node, uh, oh, sorry, if p pointer type equals times, well, then I need to return Exactly the same thing as I said, except multiplication instead. So if I first call execute to execute the left subtree, p pointer orgs zero times execute p pointer orgs one. And in this tree, this example of a tree, we have also numbers and variables. So let's continue with, um, I'm drawing it up here, with the next else. Uh, if it's a number, if p pointer type equals number, so it's a leaf node with a number in it, then we return well, what do we return? What do we return if we have reached a leaf node with a number in it? Yeah, which we might have in leaf value. So just return p pointer leaf value. Like this. Because, of course, the value of the number 4 is the number 4. And finally, else if um, p pointer type equals variable or id or whatever we call it, well, then we don't return the number of the variable because, of course, we need to look up the variable's value. So we look up, look it up, and. <coughs> wherever we store the values. If you have uh, done lab number two already, you have probably stored variable values in the symbol table. So you would do something like this, return um, sim table, and then you get this leaf value. point value, something like this, or wherever you store your variable values. Yeah. If we have a program with, let's say, functions that you can call that have local variables, you might need to keep track on 
which symbol table or rather which environment with variable values you're working with. Because as you remember, you can have a variable called A and it can be in a local variable in the function, it can be a local variable in another function, it can be a global variable and so on. But some way you look up the value of the variable and return it. Okay? What if it is not just a simple expression? What if the source code that you got is not 2 times a plus 4, but instead, let's say, if a is less than 2, set x to 9, else? How do we handle that? Well, let's look at first how the syntax tree looks and how we add that to the code. Uh, let's add else y equals 9 there, so we have two, so we have an else part also. Okay, how will the tree look for this? Well, you remember you can build a tree for an if statement. And you have a condition, you have a part to do if the condition is true, and you have a part to do if the condition is false. And the condition, well, you can build a tree of any expression, including a is less than 2. You just have the operator uh, here in, in uh, the parent node, as usual, as with plus and times. Uh, and what was the true part? We should set x to 9, else we should set the variable y to 9. Okay? And the tree nodes, you will have uh, an if node with three subtrees like this, where you have, uh, let's call it less with uh, two and so on. I'm not going to draw the entire tree. Well, maybe I'm going to draw uh, this part. So, We see it's an assignment. Okay. Well, back to our code for the execute function. Else, if p pointer type equals if. So you have defined a macro or an enum that says that if is, for example, 260. And if the type of the node is if, if we get here and we get a pointer to this if node, what do we do now? Well, what we don't do is execute, start by executing all three parts because these parts are conditional. So this one or this one should be done. So <clears throat> can you read this down here or should I? Okay, uh, <clears throat> let me put brackets around this entire part here. Well, we should start by running this first part, the condition, to see if it's true or false. And I can put it in a variable, int uh, condition, and I set it to, well, I execute this left subtree, which is p pointer uh, args zero. p pointer args zero. So now I get the condition, and if the condition is true, if 
condition, if it's true. Then run the left, uh, or rather middle subtree, the true, true part. So I call execute on p pointer orgs 1, like this. And else I should do the else part. Else execute p ports pointer p pointer orgs 2, like this. And because it's an if statement, a conditional um, thing to do, in the source, the interpreter will also have an if statement. Isn't this kind of cheating? Yeah, uh, well, it is sort of cheating. <laughs> and <clears throat> if you, uh, you can, um, you don't need this variable call condition. You could take this part and compress it a bit, which might look even more like cheating. This red part here, which is all you do, uh, if I replace it with if p if execute p pointer orgs zero, and I need an extra parenthesis at the end. <coughs> if it's true, I don't need to store it in a variable. If it's true, well, execute the middle part. Else, p pointer, execute p pointer orgs two like this. So then it's even more cheating. But I, I wouldn't really call it cheating because, well, you have a condition and two parts in the source, so the interpreter needs to do, do one of them. It needs to check it, so an if statement is the obvious way to do it. And if you have um, a while statement, this while, or I typically I would write this um, below here, so. and maybe even with curly brackets like this. Yeah. Well, obviously this uh, will be an infinite loop, but that doesn't matter to us because we're looking at the tree and how to interpret co code like this. Well, it becomes a tree and if I uh, draw it directly as, a, as the structs, I will have um, two subtrees to the while node, the condition and the body of the loop. And here you have the last part with the variable, or rather variable x, and the number four. And here in the body of the loop, you will have an assignment with the same variable, x, and a number, that is the number 3. Okay. So, what do we do if we get to a while node? Well, let's add another else down here. So, the code uh, continues. Else, if p dot type equals, well, this is too, well, 
like this. Well, if you <coughs> look at what we did with the if statement, and especially the more compact version we had here, then you may be able to guess how to handle a while loop. While this uh, left subtree, while execute p orgs zero, while that is true, so perform the body. So it doesn't need to be harder than that. Now you can handle while loops using a while loop, which is, of course, the simplest way. Let me uh, <coughs> see if <coughs> we could have done it step by step, as we did uh, using when we when we did the if uh, node over there. If I instead of this uh, store the condition in a variable, let's say at this red part here, I start by defining the variable condition which is the value of the expression. So I call execute on this port here, execute p orgs zero. And then while condition, I execute the right port here. I mean, all I did was uh, use a, uh, <coughs> an intermediate variable condition to make it clear what happens. And it worked for the if node. So it should be okay for the while node? No. No, why not? Because that condition variable will not be updated. Yeah. Because the while, a while loop, of course, has to check the condition every time you get back to the start of the loop. So you can't evaluate it once and then be done with it. So this is the wrong way to do it. So. Because you, you <coughs> uh, in contrast to the introductory students on the, uh, the Python course I had, a few weeks ago, uh, you know that the variable is not sort of bound to the result of this, so it's re-evaluated every time uh, you use the variable. So instead, the variable is a box where you put a value and then you have that value there until you put a new value in. Okay? So, now you can build an interpreter, which is lab number six. In lab number five, or assignment number five, you will build these trees, and in number six, you will execute them, like this. Okay. So, next port, stack machines. And we have already worked with uh, <coughs> stack machines that calculate values. Remember this, that if it's a number, put it on the stack. If it's an operation, pop two numbers from the stack, add them together, or whatever the operation says, and put back the result on the stack. So if you have an expression like 2 plus 4, you remember how to translate this to postfix code. You can think of it as first the tree, 
And what is postfix? Well, postfix just means <coughs> print the parent node at the end. So postfix means first print two, then print four, and then print plus. That's all there is to it, to translate to postfix. Of course, infix means print the parent node between the left and the right subtrees of two, and then comes the plus, and then comes the four. And prefix, if this is infix and this is postfix, then of course prefix means print the parent node first, plus two, four. And you apply this recursively. I know that some of you have a bit of, think this is a bit difficult, but it's, it really isn't. Uh, if you have something like two times three plus four times five, again, make a tree of it. And the tree, if you sort of circle the sum expressions like this, you know you need to do 2 times 3 first and 4 times 5 and then you can do the plus. And drawing circles around things like this is the same as drawing a tree or building a tree. I have plus as the root node because it's in the big circle and then I have multiplication here in the smaller circle with 2 and 3 as arguments. And the same thing with the other circle here, uh, subcircle 4 times 5. And then to uh, <coughs> create postfix of this, again, print the operation at the end. So <coughs> for plus here, I need to start by these two trees, these two subtrees. And if I am to print this subtree, postfix, well, let's just do it, two, three, and the operation at the end. So two, three times, sorry, two, three times. And then I need to print the right subtree before I do the multiplication. So here I have four, five times, four, five times, and now when I've printed both subtrees, I can print the plus. So postfix is a way to linearize the tree. Okay. Um, if I try to make instructions out of this. We, we have done this before, I mean, put two on the stack, put three on the stack, pop, pop, multiply, push, four on the stack, five on the stack, pop, pop, multiply, push, and then pop, pop, add, push back. So if I tried to write this as instructions, I could say push the number two, push the number three, and multiply, which means pop, pop, multiply, push. Push back the result. And I have push, uh, push four, push five, multiply, which means pop, pop, multiply, push, and finally, plus, which means pop, pop, add, push. Or you could call them multiply and plus instead of just uh, uh, drawing a star and a plus sign. So this is what I will call stack machine code. So far, this is nothing new. We have done this when we calculate values already in uh, lab number two. What 
gets a bit more complicated is when we have, um, let's say, an if statement. If x is less than 5, then uh, y is set to 6, else z or z is set to 7. You remember the uh, tree for this? If less than, if x is less than 5, then we assign y the value of 6, else we assign z the value of 7. If I tried to write this type of postfix code with the node at the end, I would get something like um, something like you don't need to write this because it's obviously wrong. Z uh, seven equals and then if. And this will be hard for the stack machine. I mean, you can use this postfix code to print the tree postfix, but for the machine that is to execute this code, blah, 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 and if at the end, okay, I should have not done all these things, I should have just done one of them. No, this doesn't work. So what you do instead, is you add jumps back and forth. And what is an if statement? It's a couple of jumps. You calculate the condition. If it is true, I don't know if you are familiar with these types of uh, uh, flow charts, but if it's true, yes, go in and do the true part, I mean the true branch, the one that, this part, y equals 6. If it's false, the condition is false, you jump to the else branch. And then you're finished. But you also need to add a jump here. If this is code that is executed linearly, step by step, unless you have a jump, then you will need a jump here. Of course, after performing this part, you need to jump over uh, the other part, so it's not executed. So you need one unconditional jump there, and you need one conditional jump. So let's make code for this. this source code. So we start by calculating the condition. So when we did push here, we pushed uh, values of numbers. Now we have the variable x. So let's push the variable x. the value of the variable x, because that's what we want to work with. Then we push the number 5, and then we perform the less than operation. And this works like plus and multiplication and all the other operations. You push the value of x on the stack, let's say it's 9, here's the stack, then you push 5, and then you pop, pop, compare them, and push back the results. And if uh, 9 is less than 5, it's not, you would put 1 there. And if it's false, you would put, well, <coughs> assuming we're using C, where 0 means false and everything else means true, uh, I would push 0 on the stack. Otherwise, if we have uh, different data types, and I have a specific data type for true and false, I would push true, uh, I mean false, okay? But this is the code for the condition. Now, if it's false,
then I need to jump. Because then I need to jump over the true part here. So let's say there is an instruction called jump if false, jump false, or go false, or jump if false. It's called something, but means look at the value and jump. And where should I jump? Well, I need a label down here. Let's call it label, no, not down there, here. Let's call it label one. And that is, of course, where the, the else part of this if statement starts. So, if it's false, we jump there. Now, we will have an interesting problem to work with. Uh, let's start by trying push y, push 6, followed by assignment. And then during the break, let's think of why this is a problem. Push y, push 6, and then the assignment. This part here. What is the problem with that? You get that as homework over the break. Okay, 50 minutes break. So let's continue with this example from before the break. What is the problem with our code? The code will be executed. No. Is it the problem that the code will be executed? That sounds like a success to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, y will be assigned six. Well, that is what we want to happen. But no, no. will it happen, specific, especially when we consider how this code worked? We push the value of... Exactly. Uh, push 5 means push the number 5. Push x, well, since we wanted to add x and 5, we'd have to push the value of the variable x. So, which would be, in this case, 9. So, <coughs> we push the value of x. And here, we push, well, if it's the same instruction, we will push the value of y. Which means I will, let's say the value of y is 1000. I push that, then I push 6, and then I get to the assignment. And where did y, the variable y, go? It's just gone. All we have are two numbers, 1000 and 6. And 1000 has no um, relation any longer to y. So we need to, uh, in some way, differentiate, make a difference between uh, left values on the left side of the equal sign. That is, the variable you're going to give a value to, and variables on the right side. Uh, C talks about, or at least used to talk about, R values and L values. L values to the left, which means the variable itself, and R values to the right of the equal sign, which means uh, the value of the variable. So we can't just use push. So let's add two new instructions. R value, which means the value of the variable. We use it when we get a variable to the right of the equal sign. And L value, which you get to the left of the equal sign. So, for example, if you have um, a short <coughs> detour with some other code here, if you have uh, a equals a plus 1, you would 
say L value A and then OR value A and then push 1 and then plus. So this port is as usual push the value of A, then push 1, then add them together and push the result back. And then you get the assignment. And when we get here, well, <coughs> L value A will put some sort of reference to the variable on the stack. Uh, and if we are working in the context of the 2.9 program, it would be the variable number. Let's say it's position 6 in the uh, uh, sum table. So variable, the number of the variable, not the value. And if we go through this code, push the variable number, then put, let's say 1000, if that was the variable value, and then one, and then we get to plus, so we pop these two, put 1001 back on the stack. And when we get to the assignment, you have a value, and a variable number on the stack. So you pop them and put this value in as the value of this variable. Okay, so to the left and to the right of the equal sign in an assignment or sort of different things for the variables. Okay. Back to our if statement. I'm leaving some space here after the true part. Or rather, you know what we're going to do after the true part. We're going to jump to the complete end of everything. So we can add a jump or go to statement. Let's say jump to label two, which we will put at the end. Label two. This is the end. Uh, <clears throat> then we have the uh, false part, the else part. So it says z equals 7. So I do l value z, I push 7, and then I have the assignment, uh, like this. So as usual, push a reference to the variable, for example, the variable number, push the number seven, and then assignment. Pop both from the stack, perform the assignment, and we are finished. And down here, the program continues after the if statement. Okay. Yes. Uh, label one. You know the L value said, you said. Yeah. So, yeah. This is. I mean, this is your. This is our program. It looks like this. That we have generated from that if statement, and label. It just means one position in the program. So I give this place in the program a label. Label number one. So I can jump to this position in the program okay. from this place. Okay. And of course, uh, when we generate code like this, uh, we can't always code, call the labels number one and number two. Because then we could only have one single if statement in our entire program. So you need to generate new label numbers or label names or whatever. So I can have another if statement later in the program and then it will have let's say label three and label four. So the labels are just places to jump to. Okay? Thomas, yes, yes. Uh, when we push the number value and uh, variable number to the start, how to uh, know which one is one, like uh, how to know that six is a variable number and not a value? Uh, when you get to the equal, the equal sign, the assignment operation in the postfix code, you will always, assuming you haven't an incorrect uh, code generator, you will always get a variable number at the bottom and a uh, value 
at the top. I mean, it, it's like if you have a <coughs> 2 plus 4, and you generate postfix code 2, 4 plus, well, you will always, when you get here, have two numbers on the stack. You will, you will never have a problem with that. And the same thing here. You will always get uh, uh, a variable number at the bottom and a value at the top. So. So, one more thing I should say. <coughs> uh, this operation, jump false, this conditional jump, uh, it takes a value from the stack. So, uh, this condition, x is less than 5, puts true or false on the stack, or uh, 1 or 0, and the jump false, the conditional jump, pops that value. Because if it didn't pop it, if it just looked at the value and let it stay there, then after each conditional jump, we would have an extra element on the stack. And the stack would fill up with those extra elements. So this means pop one value, and then depending on what value it was, we either jump to label one or do nothing. Okay. If we uh, now look at the if, uh, not the if statement, but the while statement. Are you okay with the if statement? And it translates to code with two jumps. Uh, and also, I should say that um, even if we have some other type of uh, target uh, language we are compiling for, instead of a postfix code for a stack machine. If it's assembler or something else, you will still have this structure. Uh, calculate the condition and then uh, a conditional jump and an unconditional jump, and two places you can jump to. You will need that for, for any type of um, uh, target machine. Okay. So, were there any questions on the things I just erased? Uh, oh, uh, this this instruction, jump falls uh, five, let's say, and here you have label five. So, <clears throat> like all the other operations in this stack machine, you always use the stack. So, how do I know which value should I compare to see if it's false? Well, it's on the stack. So, if I did, uh, let's say push 4, push 5 less than, which means is 4 less than 5, and yes, it probably is. Then we would have pushed 4, we would have pushed 5, and as usual with an operation, you, do, you pop the values from the stack, you calculate, you put back the result. So I pop 5, I pop 4, and is 4 less than 5? Yes, it is, so I put true, and if it's C, I might use the number 1 to mean true. And then, here, the jump falls. Well, I look at the value on the stack, at, on top of this. So I pop this one. Oh, it's removed, and it's one, so I perform the jump. Okay. Was that clear? But wh why is it called jump falls? Jump if falls. Oh, yeah, cor um, correction, um, true. Uh, what I mean in this case is, yes, you're, you're completely right. We don't jump because it's not false. Okay, that was the if statement. Let's go on with a while loop. I have a while loop while... I don't remember what I had before when we executed the... the um, uh, syntax trees, but something like this, I think. And as 
before the while uh, loop has two parts, uh, we have the uh, condition and the body. And we could even uh, make it slightly more complicated that uh, <coughs> I add another uh, line in this um, body of the loop. So now the body is A is set to 3 and B is set to 5. And again we have a loop that assuming A is less than 4 at the start we will get into this loop and it will be infinite. So it will just keep setting A to 3 and B to 5. And a while loop, we have a condition that we check. And if it is false, if the condition is false, then we jump out of the loop. So here we have the end. But if the condition is true, true, um, no, it's not false, it's true, then we go to the body. And at the end of the body, we jump back to the condition like this. So let's make postfix code out of this. Uh, first, the condition, we push L value or R value A. I mean, it's first on the line, so it can't be right. Yeah, because R value means that it's not to the left of an assignment. So it's not the variable we're going to, the variable itself we're interested in. We're interested in its value. So R value A, we push the number 4. And then less than. Calculate if it really was less than 4. Uh, put true or false on the stack. And here we have another one of these go false or jump false, I think I called it before. Jump, jump if false to, uh, uh, <coughs> let's call it label 2 because Obviously, we need to have a label at the start. So, at the start, I will have label 1. Because that's where we're going to jump at the end of the loop, back to the start. R value. I mean, if you have, if this is this thing with, if you have an assignment like this, you have the variable a in two places, but here you're interested in the variable itself because that's the variable that's going to get a new value. Here, you're not interested in the variable itself, you're interested in its value. So, L value as in left of the equal sign, R value as in right. Uh, jump falls to two, and then we get to the body here and is this an L value or an R value? L value. L value A, push, 3, and a sign. And the same with the next line here in the source. L value B, push, 5, and a sign. And then we have an unconditional jump back to the start. I don't remember if we called it jump or go to. Sure. Jump, okay. Jump to label one. And at the end here, we will have this label two with whatever code comes after here. So this jumps there and this one jumps there.
And again, we can't actually use always the numbers one and two here. We need to generate new numbers. And if it's a real program, this might be not labels with numbers, it might be positions in the code to jump to instruction number 5066 in the code. Okay, so let's combine these and have um, uh, a while statement inside an if. If a is greater than 2, then do a while a is less than 10. And in the body of the loop, a is set to a plus 1. Okay? So you have an if statement. In this case, without the else part. Uh, and in the true part of that statement, that if statement, you have a while loop. And in the while loop, you have a body which is just a is set to a plus 1. And we can uh, add um, the conditions or draw squares around the conditions too. Okay. Uh, we can, um, <coughs> to clarify, Let's draw the um, syntax tree for this. If a is greater than 2, and in this case, since we don't have an else part to the if statement, then we only have two subtrees. And under here, we have the while loop. And the while loop always has two uh, subtrees, the condition and the body. And the condition is a is less than 10. And the body is a is set to the sum of a and 1. OK. Target code for the stack machine. You remember how an if statement looks? Start by calculating the condition and then a conditional jump. If it's false, we jump over the uh, then part of the statement. So let's start with, again, L value or R value A. R value, yes. R value A push 2 greater than and if it's not true we should jump over the body so jump if falls 2 well label 1 so we have label 1 at the end with whatever code comes there. Uh, <coughs> I don't have an else part, so um, either we um, have a different template for creating an else if, uh, an else less if, uh, compared to an if with an else, or I could, I mean, add an else part which is empty here. Uh, but if we uh, ignore the else part, then I will not have um, any code generated down there for the else port. And it would be empty anyway, so let's ignore the else port. Now, here the entire while loop will be here. And then if we just leave some space here for the while loop, 
let's see, this is the while loop. Then we're sort of finished with the if statement. I mean, in block structured languages, which modern languages are, all modern languages are, uh, the, you, you um, have statements inside other statements. You have this while statement inside the if statement. You don't have them mixed together in a strange way. They always either completely outside each other or completely inside. So I have a box here for the while statement, which is the uh, true part of the if statement. So <coughs> we're finished with the if statement and we can look at the while statement inside this box. And you remember a while statement, it starts with one label that we can jump to. So at the start we will have a label and I can't call it label one as I did when we did the just a while loop because I already have a label one. So this will now be label two. And how does it look? It looks like first the condition, again or value. or value, A, uh, I push the number 10 and perform less than. And if that is true, well, continue with the next uh, iteration of the loop. But if it's false, we have this go false to the end of the loop. And I will here have label three because I did that, you remember that, at the end of the while loop I will have a, a, a label to jump to if it's... Um, if we need to jump out of the loop. Go false 3. And in here we have the body. So again, block structured languages uh, <coughs> Statements are either completely inside each other or completely outside. So here we have this body of the loop which is completely inside the loop, which is in turn is completely inside the if statement. And A is set to A plus one, well, L value or R value? Say again? L value, yes, thank you. L value A. Uh, and then, since we're on to the right of the equal sign, our value A, push 1, and plus followed by assignment. And this was not very easy to read. This is the number 1. 1. And I forget one thing, namely what? What did I forget? We're not finished yet. Go back to the story. Yeah, <laughs> at the end of the loop I need to go back. And I need to do this before I have label 3. So let me rearrange the code a bit here so you can actually read what I say. We had plus, we had 1, we had jump to label 2. And then we had, at the end, we had label three, and at the very end, label one. So, the body, so why do we have two different uh, labels at the end. Well, they are actually referring to the same place, but this label 3 is part of the while loop. I mean, the while loop always has a label at the end, which we can jump to to jump out of the loop. And then the uh, if statement, the translated if statement, also has a label here at the end, which is what we jump to when we have uh, uh, finished, or rather, when we uh, 
when the condition in the if statement is false. Then, in a later step, we can, of course, optimize away one of these labels. Or they might even automatically refer to exactly the same place in the program. I mean, labels are not really instructions. They are places in the program. So label 3 and label 1 can very well refer to the same place. Okay? Yes? Uh, what does the last one do uh, under plus? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, that should be an assignment. Thank you. I don't know why I wrote 1 there. So... A1 plus, yes. Well, I just said that labels are not statements, there are places in the program. Actually, if you do lab or assignment number seven, uh, where you will generate code for a stack machine that actually, it's already been, the stack machine itself already exists. You just need to generate code for it. Uh, in that case, labels will actually be instructions. It, it is easier to um, code, it was easier for me to code the stack machine using uh, where labels actually are instructions in the programs. But they don't do anything, they're just there for, so we can jump to them. Okay? Yeah, one thing that we might not always realize contains or means that we have to do a jump is short circuit evaluation of Boolean operators. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you. If you have code like this, if uh, A is no, correction, let's use i instead of a. If a is less than 10, uh, and the place number i in the array a is not zero, then we do something. Uh, code like this could be found in a C program where the array A has 10 places. So we start by checking if index Y is, uh, correction, index I is inside the array, because otherwise we're finished with a problem or something. We don't need to work anymore with this. Uh, <coughs> but it needs to be inside the array, and then we check that that place in the array is not zero. Uh, then we need to perform this first, of course. And if this is false, if i is 96, for example, then we should not perform this test. I mean, we don't need to because this means logical boolean and, and since both arguments to and needs to be true for it all to be true, we already know if this one is false. We already know that the result will be false, so we don't need to do this. But <coughs> according to the C standard, we're not allowed, or rather the compiler is not allowed to generate code that actually performs this. Because, well, then we would be outside the array. So, this means if this one is false, then jump over that part. Okay? If we have instead Python, I believe you say and and not uh, that symbol. 
Um, I'm not sure if you have normal array indexing in, in Python. I don't remember. Well, let's call this a Python-like language. And then <coughs> you remember you need to have, or those who have worked with Python remember that you need a colon, and then on the next line comes the true part of this if statement. Uh, again, this means jump over this part, which I don't remember if Python does. I don't know if Python guarantees that this part is not uh, evaluated if this part turns out to be false. I don't remember. I remember that in Pascal, there was no such guarantee. So, it might, the Pascal compiler might start with this one, or it might start with this one, or it might evaluate both, or just one of them which may, uh, <coughs> made it difficult to write code like this. You had to split it into several lines. You had to first calculate this, and then, if this was true, you had to go on and, and in another if statement, check uh, the array. But anyway, this code, this part, and let me draw a square around this part here. This is what we'll look at. We might look at the entire if statement and do this wrong. Let's uh, add something here. Uh, the, no, uh, actually, the array, indexing the array indexing complicates things. So let's simplify this. Uh, let's just say if x, uh, is greater than 2, and we don't need to have AND, we can use OR. Then Z equals 4. Uh, <coughs> then you have sort of the opposite problem. If the first part is true, Well, how does OR work? Well, if the first part is true, you know that the entire expression here, this part or that part, will be true. And again, in C, you are guaranteed that if this turns out to be true, you will jump over this part. Uh, so, how will this look when we generate code for it? Or value x, push 2, and greater than. And it might seem like you want to do something like this. Okay, now we are in the if statement here. So, if this was true, let's jump directly to this one. Go true, or jump true. I think we call our instructions jump. So jump if true to label one, which we have down here. And here we have uh, this part with, with L value Z, push for assignment. L value Z, push for assignment. And then, this is finished now if everything, if the x greater than 2 was true. But if it was false, well, then we need to go on and check the next one. So, uh, then we get here. So, let's do OR value Y, push 3, and greater than. And here, well, if that one was false also, then we need to jump to, to, to after this z equals 4. So then we have an unconditional jump. No, correction. Uh, we have a jump false, of course. 
to label 2, which we put down here, label 2. Okay, uh, question now, this works. This works, and you can see that, okay, if it turns out the first part is two, true, then you go directly to z is set to four, but if it was false, then you check the other part, y is greater than three, and if that was true, well, then you go on with z is set to four, but if it's false, you jump out there. So this works, but this is not the way we want to uh, generate code for this short circuit uh, operation. And why is that? Well, if I, instead of this, do condition is set to I start by calculating the condition, and then if condition I do z equals 4. Now, maybe you agree that this is exactly this, this will have exactly the same effect. I just put the value of this entire condition in a variable called cond, and if cond is true, then z, z is set to 4. The problem now is, how do I separate out this part and put it here? I can't really do this because this is mixed together with the if statement. So I want to generate code specifically for this part. And again, you remember block structure. Statements are either inside each other or completely outside each other. Here, they are the if statement and this expression here are sort of mixed together. So what I need to do to calculate this part is a bit more complicated. I need to, uh, R value x, push 2, greater than, this is the first part and the same as we tried here. But then <coughs> I can't jump true. If I try jump true here, as I did there, I have consumed, you remember that jump, conditional jumps pops a value from the stack and looks at it. So I can't pop the value because <coughs> if I jump to the end, I have no value on the stack and at the end, I should have a true or false value. So what I need to do is make a copy of it. So we invent a copy instruction that, that just, uh, we can say pop and then push, push. Now we can jump if true to the end here, label one. Now, when I get to the end, if the first part were true, if I get to the end, I have a true value on the stack. If it was false, well, then the value of everything will be the value of this one. But I have an extra value on the stack now that I need to pop. So pop it and throw it away and replace it with the result of y is greater than 3. So, r value y push 3 greater than, and then we get to label 1 here. So, this is the code we should generate for both this expression when it's part of an if statement and when it's part of not an if statement, but is used in another context. And then we can insert that code in the condition part of an if statement. And I'm not going to ask on the exam for um, exactly this, because what I 
want to show with this is more that, okay, sometimes it gets a bit complicated to generate code, uh, even for something as simple as a stack machine. Thomas, uh, do you need to push uh, or jump faults in the end before the label is it? Uh, no, because at the end, what I want at the end is a value that is either true or false. So I will then put it in this case in the condition variable, or in this case I will use it in the if statement, and then the if statement will have a jump, a conditional jump. So what this code does is it calculates x greater than 2 or y greater than 3, and puts a true or false value on the stack, depending on if the expression was true or false. Okay? Then we're finished for today. Thank you.